Father, we pray now that you would bless your word to our hearts. We don't ask for the blessing, Father, because we deserve it, but because we know it's your heart's desire. We know that your word does not come back to you empty. So fill up, Father, the full measure of our understanding by divine revelation tonight and make the words of the page, Father, make them alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 25, verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So welcome royal kings tonight. You're here, Bible's open, to search out a matter. I was thinking about the idea of of mystery. Paul is going to get into mystery. In Colossians, in Ephesians, he'll talk about the mysterion, that Greek word for mystery. And, And who's not drawn to that? You know, we love a good mystery. And the Bible tells us that God is glorified in that. He is glorified in that nothing is inscrutable to him. He's honored in that he reveals all that needs to be revealed. And and he's the only one who can do that. You know, we, by our nature, would reveal most of what needs to be revealed, but we always like to hold something back for ourselves. God reveals every single possible thing that you or I need to know in the moment for the days to come. He gives what is necessary. And we learn over time to trust him for that. But the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of his law. He gives what we need, that we will observe, that we will understand, that we can grow and walk in these things. However, there is a counterfeiter. There is one who comes along who uses our penchant for perplexity. Our interest in the mystery, he uses that to his advantage. It didn't take long. In the late 1st, early 2nd century, Gnosticism began to gain a foothold. I've already mentioned Gnosticism, that secretive, esoteric knowing. You know, people get it in their thick skulls that, that they somehow can put themselves above others by having a secret knowledge that others don't have. We did it in kindergarten. I've got a secret, you know, and grown people do this. And Gnosticism was all about that, belonging to a super spirituality, you know, that was divine beyond the average believing person. And in the last decade of the first century, Jesus tagged a name to it. He gave it a title. He called it the Bathus in the Greek. Bathus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 24, it's translated, the deep things of Satan. The deep mysteries, you know, those those secretive things, the bathus. The word literally means deep or below the surface. You know, Hinduism would call it the kundalini thunder, you know, that kind of rolls underneath. You got to get down into those deep things. And this was already happening in Colossae. Some were seeking seeking these below-the-surface deep things. This, This chatter was seeking to undermine the very simple and clear and obvious truth of Jesus Christ that had come to Colossae. So after arguing in Colossians chapter 1 for the character of Christ, and I know we're not done. I know we have a few verses left. In fact, one of the most difficult verses in all of Scripture is toward the end of chapter 1. We're going to deal with all that on Sunday. I'm going to save it. But Paul lays out the character of Christ in chapter 1 because that's where you begin. In fact, that's the beginning, the middle, and the end. But he goes first to Jesus, lays out his character, and then in chapter 2 he begins now to argue against the confusion of Colossae, which has to do with these secretive, these, these mystical, these mysterious things. I remind you, as we talked about in the introduction to Colossians, that their confusion is a a syncretistic amalgam of really all kinds of things. As we read through chapter 2, they will emerge. You will see them. Things that Paul specifically calls out as being either heretical or at best confusing. Certainly not of the Lord God. Things like that pre-Gnostic kind of spiritualism, uh, traditionalism, 
seeping in where they need not seep in. Mystical beliefs and even the folklorish pagan uh, Phrygian beliefs that were there in that region prior to Rome coming in. All these things. But here's the deal. For every cloudy heresy, Paul clears the air with one simple answer. Christ. There is a reason and, and the beauty of this letter to the church of Colossae, there is a reason that he lays out Jesus first. That he presents the colossal Christ, as I called him, first. But you will notice as we go through and deal with all these secretive heresies and these, these false teachings in chapter 2, that for every single one, Paul returns to the answer, Jesus Christ. Again and again and again. May we never grow tired of coming back to Christ of focusing on Jesus and of elevating His name. Chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for those who have not personally seen my face. Remember, no one had seen Paul. At least in Colossae, they didn't know him. He hadn't visited Colossae as a fellowship. Oh, there were some. Philemon knew him. He was from Colossae. Epaphras knew him. You know, but, but the church there hadn't seen his face, nor in Laodicea, nor do we believe that he personally had visited Hierapolis. But he says, for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged. I always think that, that it's encouraging for people not to see my face. He says, having been knit together in love and attained... See, that's why we don't yet have video, Glenn. You know, people keep saying, we need to videotape the, the, the teachings. And I'm like, Why? Why? You're just going to scare people away. Anyway, I'm sorry. For all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wealth, treasure, Paul goes to the heart of what is of greatest value in the world, and it is Jesus Christ. Wealth and value and treasure. And later in the chapter, he's going to say, let no one keep defrauding you. That is ripping you off of the treasure that is Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 4, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. Now, as he begins this section, we really hear the, the apostle's heart. We haven't met face to face, he says, but you matter to me. You really matter to me. And this is not Paul buttering anybody up. He's just, you know what? I absolutely accept and believe in the integrity of the apostle Paul. He doesn't say things he doesn't mean. For one thing, he's writing by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, there's got to be truth there. And he says, I, I care about you. I love you. I'm thinking about you. You matter greatly to me. In fact, he says, I have a great struggle on your behalf. That word struggle is agonia. It's where we get our word agony. I am agonizing over you, Paul says. That word agonia, it was originally a contest, like a foot race. They would call that the agony. I've known that agony. You know, when you, you get that last turn and, and the muscles are burning and the bones are aching and it's all you can do to, to get across that, that line. But eventually, in, in the Greek use of that word agonia for a, for a foot race, it became a, a description of physical ache, aching over anything. And then it became an emotional ache over anything. And that's how Paul's using it here. I am just agonizing over you. I'm aching for you. And more than any other thing, what Paul ached for was that people would know Jesus. And I pray that we share that ache. I pray that if we're going to agonize over anything as a church body and as individual followers of Jesus, we would agonize over people knowing him. That our prayers would be agonia, you know, a foot race, as it were. Feeling the actual pain in prayer that people would know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's why I keep saying, I'm a broken record on this, especially recently, if it's not about Christ, it is not our mission. We had a great meeting today uh, with, with several, a couple of mission guys. And talking about our missions team. And, and, and I, I, this thing's going to blow wide open. 
Okay, and, and I'm not, this is not just words. It's actually the first time I've said this in 13 years. This missions focus is going to blow open. And I was meeting with the guys today and telling them we need more people involved in missions. We need a team of people involved in missions for the right vetting and, and for opportunities coming up because so many are happening. But at the core of it all must be Jesus. We must be ignited with the message of Jesus Christ. Embracing as a church and again as individuals a Christocentric life where Jesus really is front and center in all of our choices. And we need to not just be a church that shows up to shore up our salvation. We're here to send out. We're here to be developed and trained so that we can go forward and see other people saved. We agonize over that. Mitch brought up today, he said, you know, for all the foreign missions and the things that we're being sent out to do and, and, and the opportunities that are coming to us, what God keeps telling me is your greatest mission is right here. And all those who are lost that surround this little building, we need to agonize over that. As Paul had agony for Colossae. Now, Paul refers to Jesus here in two ways. He refers to him as God's mystery. The mysterion, as I I said. God's mystery. He had talked about that, used that phrase when he wrote his letter to Rome, Romans 16.25, the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. You see, Messiah was mysterious. Messiah was something unknown, uh, preached and prophesied that this one would come, this prophet after the pattern of Moses would come. But he wasn't a known entity, and and so the Hebrew prophets themselves, though they would speak the words, were searching to understand what it meant, who he was, when he would come, what he would look like. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.7, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. What is that mystery, Paul, that you keep referencing here? Well, we don't even have to wait till the end of the story. The mystery is Christ. And the mystery is, as we'll talk about Sunday, Christ in you. Christ in you, Paul calls it, the hope of glory. Keep your finger there and turn over just for a second to 1 Peter. Go write a few books to 1 Peter, chapter 1, and listen to how Peter described what the prophets themselves were going through related to this very mystery that was eons old. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. He writes, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. They were looking into these things. They wanted to know these things. And that that verse fascinates me because that says Isaiah didn't always know what Isaiah was talking about. That David wrote songs not realizing how messianic they truly were. how, How they spoke of Messiah. When he said, you will not let your Holy One see decay. He must have written that down and thought, well that sings well, but I have no clue what that means. Moses prophesied things he didn't know. He knew it was from God. He knew it was to, he was to say these things, but he didn't know why or when or how. And in fact, it goes on, verse 11, that these prophets were seeking to know what person or time, I love this, the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And I've shared this before. Jesus was telling them about when Jesus was going to come. I mean, when you want to blow the back in your mind, there it is. <laughs> Christ is telling the prophets about Christ. The colossal Christ. The preeminent one. Who was here forever and will be forever. And was telling them this is the deal. God's mystery. And for all the looking of the prophets and even the longing of the angels. For angels longed to see these things. To understand these things. To look into these things. Peter writes that. Things into which even the angels wanted to understand. I mean, can you imagine that? The angelic host in the presence of God, and God's doing something, and they're like, I have no idea what's going on down there. Gabriel, do you understand this? No, I just do what he tells me to I go when he says go. The mystery. And it was a mystery a long, long time. 
roughly 4,000 years. And then it happened. Gabriel was dispatched. Mary was told. Joseph had the dream. The baby was born. And the mystery began to unfold. And even the angels were just watching, fascinated. God became a man. Wow, what a mystery. This is amazing. Wait a minute. He's, he's been arrested. That doesn't make any sense. Wait, they're hauling him off to crucify him? No, it's not possible. At the last minute, this is going to be great. This is good. The end of the book. God's going to come booming out of the heavens. We're all going to come riding in. Why aren't we gearing up, Lord? Why aren't we putting on armor and, and mounting the horses to charge? And then he died. You ever watch one of those TV shows and you're wondering, how in the world are they going to get out of this mess? You know, it's a, it's a good good writers who can get you to the point where you know that the main star is going to be there next week. You know that? But you're still on the edge of your seat going, oh man, there's no way out of this one. And that was the angels and the prophets. There is no way out of this one. And then the stone was rolled away. And Jesus rose from the dead and the mystery was revealed. Christ Jesus, the eternal one. But he wasn't done. God was not through with the mystery. Why? Because the mystery suddenly exploded on a day called Shavuot, Pentecost. When suddenly Christ, the risen one, came into his people. Christ in you. God's mystery. And Paul presents him that way. He is God's mystery. He also calls him, in essence, God's treasure trove. Note that he says there in verse 3, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God's mystery, God's treasure trove. All the treasures, not some of the treasures, not most of the treasures, not a good deal of treasure. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, place this in Colossae. Because there, as with today, people were bringing in new mysteries. Deeper things, additional teachings, more books, new concepts and ideas. I like what John Corson says. He says, if it's new, it isn't true. And if it's true, it isn't new. I mean, that's a Corsonism right there if I've ever heard one. We realize that wisdom and knowledge, they don't come from inside us, right? We have to receive it. We have to gain wisdom. We have to get knowledge. And it takes discipline and it takes some hard work. But listen, wisdom and knowledge doesn't also come from stretching to reach the heights or digging down, straining to plumb the depths. That's not where true wisdom and knowledge comes from. What do you mean? Romans chapter 10, verse 6. The apostle writes, The righteousness based on faith... Faith speaks as follows. Don't say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. No. What does faith say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. Which we are preaching. So what does that mean? Well, Christ is the treasure trove, right? Christ is the mystery. Christ is the treasure trove. You need to understand this. This is huge. All the wisdom and knowledge we desire, we cannot achieve without Him. But I'll take it a step further. All wisdom and knowledge will not come to us from Jesus either. What do you mean by that? It doesn't come from Him. It is in Him. And that's the difference. The mentality is those who say you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life. You come to Jesus because you think that you can ask him for things and get knowledge, special or esoteric knowledge, through the right kind of asking at the right time through the right study. And the reality is, Jesus says, it is these that testify of me. You want wisdom and you want knowledge? Don't ask him for it. Seek him. Seek to know Jesus. Set your heart to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. The wisdom and the knowledge, they're in Him. He is the treasure trove. It's not a separate thing. 
I think it's important to understand that. He doesn't dole out treasure to the highest bidder or the hardest worker or the holiest worshiper. He is the treasure. It's not what he gives, it's who he is. You get the difference there? Religion chases after what he gives. Religion is Solomon. Solomon saying, God, give me wisdom. Well, that's religion. Relationship says, God, give me yourself. I want you. I want Jesus. Got to know Jesus. And so in verse 4, he says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. It's not about all the right teachings. It's about the right person, Jesus Christ. In verse 5, for even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. And that's it. Faith in Christ, even more so than faith in good teaching, faith in Bible study. It's faith in Christ. And the focus is on him. People come up with all kinds of things that sound intellectual. That sound convincing? Every cult related to Christianity in history pings off of a single verse. Wrongly used, wrongly translated, misapplied. But still, people say, well, see, it says this in the Bible, or it says that in the Bible. And they will base entire cultish religions around one thing that is out of context. But if the focus is on Jesus, we see the big picture. We see all of it pointing back to and focusing in on Him. What's interesting to me is those pseudo-intellectuals, you know, the, those who will come along and, and try to undermine true faith with what they call fact, you know, or science, or intellectual, intellectual musings. They're the very same ones who will call faith absurd. People like theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, who I've mentioned before. He is the poster child of human brilliance today. You want to find someone that society, that science, that the world says this is an absolutely beyond brilliant man, it's Stephen Hawking. And in his 2010 book entitled The Grand Design, Hawking wrote the following. One can't prove God doesn't exist, but you're going to love this. Science makes God unnecessary. No, you're unnecessary. <laughs> he goes on, he writes literally, spon- li- listen, you're going to love it. This is just amazing to me. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. I mean, you know, it's the emperor's new clothes. I'm sitting here, I listen to him say that, and I say, he is completely naked. He doesn't know what he... I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing and why the universe exists and why we exist. You know what that's called? (laughs) Faith. It's blind faith. It's bogus faith. But Stephen Hawking is applying the principle of faith, believing in something he cannot see and claiming that as reality. And, And that's absurd. God came along and put on flesh, dwelt among us, and lived out in reality and proved himself, proved his love. He didn't just speak his love. Oh, he spoke it, like I said, for 4,000 years. He spoke it in a mystery. And then he went to Calvary. And there on the cross, every last human being can look and say, that's love. That is the love of God. He proved himself. And now what does he ask us for? Blind faith? No. He asks us for faith, which is trust. Trust him when he says he loves you. Trust him when he says he will save you. Therefore, Paul writes, verse 6, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Be established. I love the word established. There's strength there, you know. And Paul says to the church at Colossae, and I think he could say it to us tonight, 
you've been established. Hey, you've got a foundation. You no longer have to dig deep. You need to stand firm. In fact, I think it's wiser to build up rather than to dig deep. We don't go searching and trying to plumb the depths for something other than Christ. See, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.10, According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's nothing else underneath that foundation, folks. Jesus is the foundation. We don't need to dig to find something else. And so now, rather than digging and looking in other places, we stand on the foundation. We build up on the foundation. What's the difference between digging and building? Well, you dig to try and unearth some kind of new thing. But you build on what you know. And that's what Paul's saying to Colossae. It's what the Word is saying to us tonight. Build on what you know. You know Christ. Build on Him. With more knowledge of Christ... Seeking relationship with Christ, build on Him. He is the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He never changes. I was thinking driving over here. Society is always changing. Donald Trump gave a speech tonight. And one of the things he said in the speech was, You will never, ever, ever be forgotten again. And I said, Until the next you know, administration. What do you mean you will never, ever be forgotten? You can't say that. Of course we will. And of course things are going to change. It changes, you know, week to week. Our culture is constantly ebbing and flowing and changing. Now the Republicans are in control. How's that working out for America? You know, and I'm not not meaning to get political, but people put so much faith and trust that now, now we're finally going to get a handle on it. The only one who's got a handle on it is Jesus Christ, the foundation. We build on Him. Paul is countering this spirituality that says you need to dig. There's something else. There's something more. And Paul's saying, no, you don't. You don't need extra wisdom. You don't need further revelation. Because as he wrote, in Him are all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, should the Lord wait another 10 years? Should he give us one more decade? In 10 years, we here at the bridge better still be preaching Jesus. Because he doesn't change. I, don't, I cannot tell you what our country will look like in 10 years. I don't know. I mean, I hope for the best. I really do. Personally, I'm thankful that we have a good choice for the Supreme Court, a name that's been put up. I'm happy about that. Do I put my faith and trust in that? No, I don't. Because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how things are going to change. But I know who doesn't change. The one in whom are all hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And and Paul says this. It's one of my favorite things that he ever wrote. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. As you received Him, walk in Him. Okay. Well, then that should be pretty simple. How did you receive Him? Think about that. How did you receive Jesus Christ? I'm going to guess you received him honestly. I'm going to guess you received him simply. You didn't have all the answers when you received Jesus. You didn't understand the entire book, did you? Anybody read the Bible from cover to cover, having studied every verse and understood every mystery within the scriptures before they became a Christian? No. You just came to a point where in simple honesty you said... I believe in Jesus Christ. Paul says, walk like that. Walk with that kind of simplicity. You know, yes, growing in the, in the treasure trove that is Jesus, but walk as you came to Him with that kind of simple faith. That's what I would call faith for the long haul. And I like the fact that he says, you just started walking. He doesn't write, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so run like crazy. <laughs> Run like mad. Go, go, go. He says, as you received him, walk. I hear that and I think, I can do that. I can walk. I can take one step. And then I'll take another one. 
I can walk. Think back to Israel in the wilderness. What a great picture. They were in the wilderness and they did not race to the promised land. There may have been a few kids when they first left Egypt who took off running, you know, and they got about 100 yards ahead and in the desert he just kind of went, (laughs) stop. What did they do? For 40 years they walked. Three million people don't run. They walked. God led them and they walked. That's the picture of faith. Faith is not an immediate. Faith is a long walk. What has been called a long obedience in the same direction, which I really like. Just keep walking. You will be amazed. When you start walking, you'll be amazed at how far you get. And how a year of walking takes you further than you ever could have imagined. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 5 says, Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Micah 4, 2, many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. And John said famously for us now, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Just keep walking as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Don't think that you've got to be super spiritual. And let me tell you what. For those who walk the long walk, the spirituality comes. The depth of wisdom and insight and understanding and revelation, that all comes. You just walk. Let God pour into you who He is. Let Jesus fill you with all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that, that comes in Christ Himself. For our part, we just walk. What does that mean? It means tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to start walking with Jesus again. And I'm going to walk with Him tomorrow. And if He doesn't come, I'm going to go to bed and the next morning I'm going to get up and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk. I'm not sprinting for super spirituality. I am just walking and waiting on the Lord. Can you do that? I mean, does that sound difficult to anybody? I don't know, walking, that's a pretty tall order, Rick. (laughs) As you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. Now, beginning around verse 8, Paul starts to lay out some of these confusions, and we see them emerge from the text. And he's going to give five, and we'll point them out as we go through tonight, five confusions that will trip up a good walk. So you're walking with the Lord, you've given your life to Him, you just have simple faith that Jesus is God, and you're believing Him for it. And as you walk, there are some things that can, that can trip you. Number one, empty philosophy. Empty philosophy. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Boom, there it is, right back to Jesus. How do I counter empty philosophy with Jesus? Now, in American culture... Our education used to begin with the Scriptures. And many of you know this, that the Scriptures were the basis of education. That was the point. If you grab a hold a copy of the, of the New England Primer, which was for elementary school education of our children, it went through the entire alphabet. A is for Adam. And every letter of the alphabet is tied to Scripture and a biblical story that was behind the letter. And that's how people learned in our country, in our, country, in our culture. That's what was taught in those days. Our Ivy League schools today began as scriptural seminaries. They started as seats of learning where the Bible was taught. Where people went to gain education and then to pastor churches. At Princeton, Yale, these were Christian seats of education. They are so far from that now, it's it's not even funny. In fact, now I have trouble finding a a seminary anywhere to which I would entrust any young person. In fact, honestly, if if you're, say, 18, 19, 20 years old, you're like, Rick, I want to go to a good Bible college. Where should I go? I'd say, about the only one I could encourage is Calvary Chapel Bible College. I'd send you there because they're still teaching the Bible. I don't know of another one. And there are some 
epic, great institutions of the past that I wouldn't send kids to now because of what they're teaching. Empty philosophy and deception and stuff that is it's not of Scripture. Steve Martin one, one time said, that great philosopher, he said, I learned just enough philosophy in college to mess me up for the rest of my life. And then he added, I guess I wouldn't believe in anything anymore if it wasn't for my lucky astrology mood ring. I mean, that's empty philosophy. And James, he wrote in James 3.14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Let me say this. Human philosophy is arrogant. For us to stand up and say we have all the letters after our name, we have all this wisdom and knowledge that we have developed and gained over the years, that is human arrogance. You can be the most learned person on the planet and be an idiot. I'm not naming names, but I named one earlier. We'll just leave that alone. Do not be arrogant. And then James says this. This wisdom, this this arrogance, this selfish ambition, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. There's two kinds of wisdom, if you want to call it that. There's the wisdom from below. And there is the wisdom from above. Wisdom from below, flesh, earth, demonic, wisdom from above is Christ, is Jesus. And Paul answers this whole thing in verse 8, continuing. He says, rather than according to Christ, those elementary principles, philosophy 101, verse 9, he says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I don't know how you could say any more plainly Christ is God. If you weren't sure, listen to that again. In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now there are some who believe that at Corinth they were using this word fullness, pleroma, as, a, as a, an existential extra teaching, as a, a deeper spirituality. Oh, you got to get the fullness. And in fact, that Greek word pleroma was used quite a bit by the Gnostics in the second century. Got to get the fullness. Well, Paul's saying the fullness is Christ. The fullness of God is in Christ. You want the fullness? You got to go to Jesus. There's no other way to get the fullness of God or to come into the presence of his fullness. And in verse 10, he says, and in him... You have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Now that being said, if he's the head, why would anyone bend to human reason? Why would we give ourselves over to empty philosophy? Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of God. The second thing that Paul notes here. Empty philosophy, number one. Secondly, elemental ritualism. Elemental ritualism, or if you want to make it easy on yourself, ritualism 101. Verse 11. And in him, Paul says, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And some will read this verse and say, wait a minute. Isn't Paul trading out one ritual for another? I mean, isn't he just saying, look, circumcision, that's, that's kind of a ritual, a Jewish ritual handed down to Abraham. As Paul talked about in the letter to Galatia, isn't that kind of a ritual? And now now you're saying, okay, it, it needs to be a spiritual circumcision. Great. How does that happen? Baptism. We've just jumped out of one ritual and into another, right? Yes, if you think that by being baptized, you can attain to some level of holiness. If you think that by being baptized, you are doing something which you know, which works this holiness in you that you have now accomplished something. But note the phrase that Paul uses in verse 12. After having said you are now circumcised, not in one with, made with hands, it was a circumcision without hands, in the removal of your flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He cuts off the flesh. 
He removes that. But then he says, having been buried, note this, with him. Having been buried with him in baptism. And the two key words here are, well, the one is baptizo, which is baptism. And it's the reason we have a pool, because the word baptizo means to submerge. It's what it means. But that's not the operative word. I, I thought it was at first. But looking back, no, the operative word here is, I believe, buried with. Buried with. See, it's not about baptism. If we make it about baptism, it's another ritual. But if the idea is about being buried with, the word is sunthapto. Sunthapto, which is to bury together with. And Paul uses that word one other time. Just one other time in the scriptures. Back in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, he says, Therefore we have been buried with him. Through baptism... I mean, baptism is the outward show of it, sure. We, we use that as, a, as kind of a, a thing to show what, what's really happening. It's what the Jews didn't understand about circumcision, that circumcision was just showing what was really happening. It wasn't the circumcision that was the issue. It was what it represented. And, it is, and that is that God had chosen Abraham and his seed, very graphically, to be blessed. And so baptism in and of itself, if it's all focused on baptism, yes, it's a ritual. However, if the focus is on being buried with him, well, now we've got, as Les likes to say, a whole new day. Therefore, having been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Notice that he said walk. For if we have become united with him... In the likeness of his death, surely we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So it's not about ritual, it's relationship. Having been buried with him. That I'm going in with Christ. And and this whole thing is in that external representation of what spiritually is happening. And that is a unification with Jesus that is absolutely marvelous. And Paul is arguing this to say, look, don't go back to ritualism 101. Don't head right back to Jewish circumcision because that's not going to save you. And Christians, don't think that by being dunked, that's what saves you. That's just the outward expression. What saves you is being buried with him. As Christ, as as Paul said in Galatians 3, that you put on Christ. Don't go back to ritualism, ascribing baptism to a work of personal holiness. It's not. Verse 13, Paul says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, having made public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Let me just underscore this. I know you know this, but I think sometimes we need to be remembered. What kind of condition were you in when you made the decision to believe? It's very simple. You were dead. You were dead. It doesn't get much worse than dead. It doesn't get much more rotten. There's not much more decay. Once you're dead, you're dead, right? So why is it the believers will struggle? Did did, did God really save me? I don't know. Because I'm not as good right now. I've had a bad week. You know, look, you were dead. And it was when you were dead that he died for you. It was when you were dead that he did everything that was necessary. So that all you have to do is say, I trust you, Lord. And you don't ever have to go back to that place of death again. He made you alive. And again, he uses that word, with him. Together with him. You notice over and over Paul's saying that. Together with him. Together with him. Together with him. Soon thought though, this is a togetherness issue. And in so doing, he forgave us all our transgressions. Wow! Now, think back. Remember the legalizers in Galatia? Those guys who came along and they said, you've got to cut the flesh literally. 
to be made whole spiritually. And what they lost was the simple symbolism that circumcision was. It was a picture of, of that much deeper, more lasting, more wonderful promise of God. They lost the simplicity of it for the sharp slashing of, of ritualism. And Paul covered that extensively in his letter to Galatia. In fact, he wrote Galatians 4.11, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Now, I know some of you are saying, Rick, you just wanted to quote that sicko verse again. You're right. (laughs) But my friends, the answer to ritualistic legalism is the person of Jesus. Again, he is the answer. Buried with him, now made alive together with him. And Paul says in verse 14, marvelously, he's canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. What was the certificate of debt that he canceled out on the cross? It's the law. But it's more than the law. Get this. It is the list of your sin exemplified by the law. And the reason I point that out is sometimes we we say, oh yeah, he canceled out the law, and the law is this like distinct, different thing. Hey, the law came in, Romans 5, 20, so that transgression would increase. God gave the law so that you would sit there and look at yourself by comparison to the law and go, oh no, I'm dead. I'm a sinner. And in realizing that, now... Now, that decree that's tacked up on the cross, imagine if it was a list of your personal sin life. Because that's what it is. The certificate of death, or certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us. The decrees are the law. The debt is your sin and mine. And at Calvary, canceled, done, wiped away completely. That word canceled there is exalepho, and it means to blot out, to wipe out, to wash out, or to obliterate. Now, in our digital printing, we don't fully understand this, but imagine a, a sheet of fresh papyrus that has been written in ink, and someone comes along, and they have a clean, cleansing agent, and they have a rag, and they start to wipe. And all those letters start to wash and fade, and, and becomes just kind of a puddle of 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 ink, and then the ink just gets washed off, and now you've got this fresh parchment, and there's nothing there. Where's your sin now? And the cleansing agent, gang, it's the blood of Christ. The perfect cleansing agent that blots out the ink stains of sin clean off the page, erase completely. You know, we're the only ones that remember that stuff. God doesn't. He's blotted it out. He has washed it clean. What can wash away my sin? You answer? Amen. Look at verse 15 again. And then he says, when he had... Okay, you you all know this is one of my favorite verses. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities and made public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, and I call it the Monty Python verse, which I did a couple Sundays ago. And I love it. I I love the picture of the Black Knight. And if you never saw Monty Python and the Holy Grail, let me illuminate for you. The guy is going to cross a bridge, and the Black Knight's standing there and says, None shall pass. And they start to get in this duel, and the guy just takes one swipe, and his right arm falls off. Blood starts to spurt out, you know. And it's just silly the way they do it. And he says, None shall pass. And he swings his sword, and and the other arm falls off. Now he's disarmed. And then after that, he takes a third swipe and literally cuts his legs off. So now he's down on the ground at about waist level, and, and there's this little body with his head of the Black Knight, and he says, come back here and fight me, you know? The guy walks by him and says, what are you going to do, bleed on me? And I always think of that when I read this verse, and you know what? I was wrong. When he had disarmed... The rulers and authorities, let me give you a more graphic picture that Paul is painting, and the average person in Roman society would pick this up very quickly. The word disarmed literally means to put off or to strip. When he stripped 
is what Paul is writing. When he stripped the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, what does that mean? The Roman army would come back from battle, come marching down the Appian Way there in Rome to the cheers of the crowd. And perhaps you've heard that example of, of, of perfume, that the people would throw perfume on the, on the Roman soldiers as they marched by. And, and so to all those who were victors, which was the people of Rome, it smelled like victory, but to the army trailing along, along behind, it smelled like death. But there's more to this. See, what they would do is the commander would ride in his chariot, you know, down the Appian Way. The flowers are flying, the perfume's flying, the people are cheering. And then the Roman army, victorious, would march behind him. And then behind them came the captive army, stripped. That they would march these men naked along the Appian Way. They weren't, well, I'm sure they were doing it to shame them. But the picture in those days wasn't just how embarrassing. The picture was, there's not a spot of armor on any of these guys. There are no swords. There are no weapons of warfare. These guys are vanquished. And that's the picture Paul has just painted. He disarmed the authorities. He stripped them down. That is the enemy and his devilish horde stripped. Stripped of what? Stripped of all accusation against you. Stripped of all evidence that could be used. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? Because there's nothing that holds up in court. All the evidence was, that was there in the decree, the certificate of debt, it's gone. And so the enemy doesn't have anything on you. He's been stripped of it. What he had on you before Christ was sin. What he has on you after Christ is nothing. Before Christ, he had a powerful, factual case, evidence for condemnation. After Christ, he's got nothing. He's been stripped. And so he cannot condemn anymore now he's still going to try he can't condemn you but he can accuse you and so he's called the accuser of the brethren and day and night he stands before the Lord saying look at what they did look at what they did and all the while Jesus is saying what what do you mean look at what what they did there's nothing there look at the papyrus all that's left on the papyrus is a spot of blood my blood And nothing left that can be used against you. You know what's marvelous? God told Satan he was going to be stripped way back in the Garden of Eden. All the way back, Genesis 3.15, he shall bruise you on the head. That is, Jesus would deal the death blow to Satan. And you shall bruise him on the heel. And we think, okay, well, he gets the death blow, but boy, Jesus still got bruised on the heel. Even that is victory. Because the bruising on the heel happened when the spikes went through the feet and the blood came out that washed the papyrus clean. You get the picture that I'm trying to paint here. And that's the marvel of of what Jesus did having stripped the rulers and the authorities of any and all power. Therefore, God spoke through Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors would you allow yourself tonight if for nothing else to leave this place recognizing you're clean you are clean by the blood of Christ wonderful Satan's got nothing on you. Again, he accuses, he plays the blame game. But all you have to say is, I am together with Jesus. I'm together with Jesus. I'm in the Jesus party. I'm on his ticket. I'm walking with him. Yeah, but you did this. I'm with Jesus. And then we hide behind his robes, you know. (laughs) I love it back there. Fight for me, Jesus. I am with him. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount. I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
And it is the answer to empty philosophy and elemental ritualism. And number three, elementary legalism. Which is another issue here at Colossae, verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, we're talking old school Judaism, but in the last couple hundred years, there's an entire movement in Christianity that says if you don't worship on the Sabbath day, you are a heretic. You worship on Sunday? Well, you're a heretic. You can only worship on Shabbat. You've got to keep the Sabbath. Well, this is pretty clear. You know what what, what the Sabbath is, Shabbat? It's a shadow. Shabbat is a shadow of what? Of the substance, which is Jesus Christ. He is the rest. You know, God gave the people a day of rest. I want you to keep a day of rest. A day where you you think about me and you're with me and you walk with me and we just have time together. And they didn't keep it at all. They were horrible. But it was to be a picture of the rest that would come through Jesus Christ. Now, this is old school Judaism. Food, drink, festivals, new moon, Sabbath day. I've told you before, it still shocks me when Christians want to become Jews. No offense to any Jewish person, because I have great respect for Israel. I hope you know that. By the way, the trip's filling up fast. (laughs) I'm serious. We have 36 who are 100% to go on this trip right now. And we just started day one on Sunday. 36 people right now, and we have another 20 or 30 who are expressing strong interest, and there are several others who are going to be shocked that we're going, oh, I want to go. I love Israel. I have great respect for the Jewish people. But the reality is when a Christian comes along and says, I want to do that, I'm like, well, okay, so you want to be a shadow walker. Why not walk in the substance? Who is Christ? All of that was to point to this. Not not this, not the British Christian Fellowship. All of that was to point to Him, to the person of Christ Jesus. The law and the prophets, listen, it's all Israel had until Messiah came. Beautiful, wonderful, profound, powerful, the Word of God, but it is all they had until Christ came. And when He came, well then... Luke twenty four twenty seven, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. Galatians three eight, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. And yet Paul says, And don't go back to elementary legalism. Don't let someone act as your judge telling you you're not keeping certain aspects of the old law going back is is like someone who their whole life they loved Hawaii thought about Hawaii had pictures that they uploaded from the internet or downloaded from the internet to put on their walls pictures of Hawaii specifically of Kona And, and all their life they dreamed of living in Kona They even took art classes and began to paint pictures of Kona, you know, and the landscape there and the sea coming up to the land and the beauty on the big island. And all their life, that's all they thought about. And then one day, financially it worked out and they were able to fly across and move to Hawaii. And they move into Kona and they buy a cliffside home with a panoramic view. And, And just like in their paintings that they used to paint, now they're there. And they sit, sipping Kona coffee, (laughs) and never look out the window, but keep looking at their pictures and their paintings. Isn't Kona beautiful? Kona's out there. It's right out there. Oh, I know, but look at this. Look at this painting I did. Look at this portrait that I did. Of beautiful Kona and not even looking at it. Jesus is the form and the substance of all the early pictures and types and portraits that God painted. That was all just to show you this. And now we have this. Why do you want to go back to that? Why are you staring back at that? When we have the substance in Jesus Christ. 
And yet some Christians still sit there gazing at the paintings and sipping Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, by the way, verse 1 says, For the law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. And by the way, since A.D. 70, they can't even make the sacrifices. There's nothing there. Shadow. Hebrews 10, verse 10 says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It's done. Don't go back to elementary legalism. John says, The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Let no one, then he says, keep defrauding you of your prize. Remember I said before that the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding early in the passage. Now he comes back to this concept of riches. And he says, don't let anybody defraud you or, or keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement, the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. Number four, the fourth confusion coming into Colossae is esoteric mysticism. And it's just... Spirituality is, ooh, this deeper stuff. It's that bathos that Jesus talked about in Revelation. It's things like angel worship. And you know what's interesting? He mentions angel worship here. Angel worship it has been a mark of the cults for centuries. In fact, it's one of the quick ways to find out if a cult is a cult. How do they talk about or deal with angels? You know that out of the 196 references to angels in the Bible, they are always incidental to something else. And what's that? To God. Throughout the scriptures, every reference of angels is in reference to the Lord. First of all, there's the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh, which I believe is a representation of God, is Jesus. You know, a Christophany, Jesus showing up prior to his existence on earth. And we can talk about that sometime. Every mention of angels is always with reference to God or His people. And never with reference to themselves. Angels are not described beyond being uh, flames of fire. Winds. You know, ministering spirits. In fact, Hebrews 1 verse 7 says of angels, He says, who makes His angels winds, His ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of His kingdom. Angels, Jesus. And angels are only there with reference to God, in worship of God. Revelation 19.10 Remember John said he saw the angel and he fell at his feet to worship him? But he writes, he said to me, do not do that. (laughs) I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You don't worship angels. And here's the thing. Angel worship and all other mystical, experiential spirituality is a rip-off. Why? It's defrauding you of the prize. It defrauds you of the prize, and that's an excellent translation. It's just a single word. Defrauding you of the prize is one word in the Greek. But it's a great translation because the reality is, if someone gets into this extra esoteric mystery stuff... That is the prize. You understand what I'm saying? That becomes your prize. For the super spiritual, for those who like the mystical stuff, and we see it even in the church, the mystical and the experiential becomes the prize rather than Jesus himself. Jesus is the prize. He's the treasure. He's the wealth. It's, again, right back to him. 
And Paul said, I press on, Philippians 3.14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, what prize is that, Paul? Jesus. He is the prize. Genesis 15.1. Do not fear, Abram. I am your exceeding great reward. I'm your shield, God says, and I am your reward. And God said that when he had all these spoils of war that he had just won. You don't need that. All that treasure, whatever. But I am your reward. Jesus is the prize from whom the blood flows to all the joints and the ligaments of the body. I love that. He is the head, Paul says. We look to the head. We hold fast to the head. What is a body without a head? Dead. (laughs) And so we look to the head because it's the head that from the head and from the working of the head. And there's a physical picture that Paul is painting of the spiritual truth that all the blood flows and moves down through the ligaments and tells us what to do and how to move and how to be. That's Jesus, man. And we look to him. And we function then as His body. By the way, just a plug for Sunday morning. Go back and look at chapter 1, verse 24. I want to give you a hint. Where Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What? Wait a minute, what? Something's lacking? There's something we have to do? I'll give you this much of a hint. It has to do with the head and the body. I'm going to leave you with that mystery. Okay, so back to chapter 2. Then Paul says this. Verse 20, and this is the final one. These are all level 101 courses, by the way. Empty philosophy, elemental ritualism, elementary legalism, esoteric mysticism, and number five, the last one, exacting asceticism. Exacting asceticism, verse 20. If you died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Why do you do that? Paul says. That man, that we, don't we see that in the church? Don't go into that bar. Don't touch that drink. Don't watch that movie. Don't do that thing. Well, Rick, are you saying it's okay to go in the bar and touch that drink and watch that movie and do that thing? <laughs> no, 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 no. The problem is when we focus on that, we lose every time. Don't go into that bar. Oh, man, that bar looks good. And don't touch that drink. Oh, man, I really could use one right now. And every time we do the don't touch, don't taste, don't feel thing, if we live in the don'ts, we're going to do. We're going to violate it. It's it's in our nature. And Paul says, "Don't, don't live that way. You know, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why are you living? As if you were living in the world, you submit yourself to such things. Verse 22, he says, which all refer to things destined to perish with use. Alcohol is going to rot and fade and die and, you know, evaporate. It's not a lasting thing. These are things destined to perish in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and a nice tie and self-abasement and a nice suit and severe trends, <laughs> treatment of the body, or, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence because, as I said, we're going to do it anyway. So the do-nots and the living with the shoulds and the oughts, that doesn't work because it just calls up our rebellion. And so in reading this, my first thought was God made gluten. <laughs> he did now granted we've added pesticides and you know genetic interference and so we've messed it up but God made it you know by the way did you know that recent reports are right now coming out for all all who are into the gluten free thing I was just told by Sunday Sunday someone on Sunday said hey Rick the reason why you're sick you gotta stop eating gluten well I've tried that God made gluten We are discovering now that recent reports are showing that gluten-free diets may lead to diabetes. So, go for it. I just thought I'd throw that out to you. You know, something to think about. 
<laughs> exactly. I'm right back to Pop Tarts, baby. No, you know what? You know what? Your diet is not your faith. Your diet is not your faith. The things, the do's and the don'ts of your life, they are not your faith. They may be an extension of your faith. You may not go into that bar because, hey, I'm spending time with Jesus and he's not going in there. So I'm just going to hang out here with him. You may not touch that thing because, well, Jesus isn't into that, so I'm not going to go do that either. Because I want to be where he is. Now that's a completely different thing. But if it's all the do nots and the should nots and the ought nots, then Christianity is not asceticism. It is not about self-denial. But some of us function as Christians like we think it is. I've got to deny myself happiness. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. And you can't stop me. Praise God. That's so ridiculous. But some of us live that way, don't we? Maybe not to that extreme. But we say, I'm going to do not. I'm going to, I, okay, okay, man, this is so hard, but I can do this. I can do this. I call that hardship Christianity, and there are too many people who are into that thing. If it's not painful or difficult or exacting, well, then it must not be God's will. Really? So whatever happened to my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Whatever happened to grace? Whatever happened to living a life where... You know what? It's not that I can't do those things. I don't want to. Because I get to be with Jesus. That, how much better is that? Jesus said, in the world, you have tribulation. You're going to have affliction. Yeah, there's going to be hard stuff. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's the faith to which we're called. A faith that has overcome. And so we're not going back to this asceticism, straining and striving and, and, and stressing. That is not God's will. In fact, a good rule of thumb for you, a good standard for a follower of Jesus who is just walking the walk of faith, is if it's stressful, it's probably not His will. If it's straining, it is hard and exacting, I think I'm outside of His will. I'm trying to accomplish something in my flesh, and that's tough business. But by the Spirit, in grace... Isaiah 26, verse 3, I'm going to read it to you in the King James because I just like the way it lays. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. A mind stayed on Jesus. That's where the shalom shalom is. The perfect peace. I I told some of you, I, I think I've said it in here before, starting this church was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. It was not hard. Now, I didn't tell anybody that for a long time because I wanted to get paid, but it wasn't a difficult thing. It was the, Cheryl can confirm this. But Rick, I happen to know during that first couple of years some tough things happened. Yeah, they did. You're right. There were some tribulations. There were some afflictions. There were some difficulties we had to walk through. But doing this was the easiest thing I have ever done. And I shudder when I hear a pastor say... I'm hanging in. Man, it's a tough, tough row to hoe. I'm like, put the hoe down. (laughs) Something's not right. And I mean this absolutely sincerely. I think something is not right when someone is following Jesus and saying, it's so hard, it's so hard. I don't think you're following Jesus then. Because his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. There will be persecutions. There will be tribulations. But I know that I am outside his will when it gets hard. That's when I know I'm not walking in faith. He didn't mean for it to be hard. When we walk in the will of the Father, note that when we walk, there is a peace that comes. When I'm in the grace of Jesus, there's a joy that flows. And that's what it's about, man. And that's what God has invited us to and called us to in Jesus. And by the way, when I'm walking with that kind of peace and faith, that's when revelation comes too. That's when I start to hear the Lord because I'm not striving so hard to hear Him. Okay, we're going to stop, but listen to the first two verses of chapter 3. We'll end there tonight. Therefore... 
Paul says, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Why is he seated? Because the work's been done. He didn't have to stand up anymore. I've told you before, there were no chairs in the tabernacle or in the temple. Because the priests, when they were in there, were at work, standing, working, doing the business. It was hard. But Jesus did the work and he went and sat down. Kicking back. Feet up. Set your mind, he says, on things above, not on the things that are on earth. Well, who is above? Jesus Christ. Set your mind on Christ. Walk with Christ. You want to avoid all these things that Paul was concerned about, the things that he agonized over for Colossae, asceticism and mysticism and legalism and ritualism and philosophy and just plain old heresy? Want to avoid that? It's very simple. Just keep walking. Come to me, you said, Lord Jesus, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Father, I pray that that rest would descend on us even tonight. Hear our song of worship. And Father, be blessed as we find our rest in You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's stand up together.